everybody, it's Jalessa again. Today I wanted to talk to you about hammers. A lot of times I get questions about different types of hammers. First, what do each of the hammers do? Second, when should I be using each type of hammer? And the last thing is, how often should I reface my hammers? Well, I'm here to tell you. So I'll catch you on the other side. Bye. Hi. Okay, we're gonna start off with the cross peen hammer. I'm gonna demonstrate this for you right now. Oh, and by the way, I have to wear my glasses because I ran out of contact, so I'm not gonna be on camera with my glasses. <laughs> okay, give me just a second. Okay, so with the cross peen hammer, I'm gonna take this piece of copper and hammer it on one side. That way you can see the deformation that happens with the cross peen. The first thing to realize is that with a cross peen hammer, when you're hitting the metal, if your metal's flat like this and you're hitting it, you're actually stretching it in only two directions, forward and backwards. So every time you hit the metal, you're actually sending the metal this way and the metal that way with every blow. So let's show you how it's done. Now I'm gonna take this to the edge of my anvil. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I don't want my metal hammer to be striking the metal anvil. That's very bad for it. So we're gonna do it on the edge of the anvil and we're gonna hammer just gently. You can start in the middle and work your way down and then go back to the middle and work your way up. So that's how I'm gonna start it. Now, the one important thing about hammers is your grip. You don't want your thumb to be on top of it. You want your thumb to be on the side of it and you want your grip to be fairly loose because you're not gonna be hitting the anvil like this and trying to make the metal move. What you're gonna do is lift and drop lift and drop, lift and drop. The bounce off of the metal will help to lift it up at a rate reasonable height and be able to drop it again over and over again. Now, if you do this correctly, you won't damage your elbow, you won't damage your wrist, and you'll be able to do this for a very long time. So I highly recommend to use the proper ergonomics with your hammers, otherwise your neck is gonna get sore and you're gonna have a lot of issues with pain at the end of the day. So let's get started. I'm gonna start in the middle, work my way back, and then go back to the middle and work my way forward. You wanna overlap your blows so that there is an even amount of movement happening in your metal. And you can already see it's starting to deform, quite frankly. And that's exactly what it should be doing. So let's continue. I'm filming. Sorry about that. There was a little bit of a hiccup. My husband got home from work and decided he wanted to say hello. So I had to pause the video. So let's get back to what we were doing. So as you can see here, this piece of metal is starting to deform. You can see it's kind of flaring out here. And then on this side, it's kind of bowing up. And the reason for that is as you stretch this piece forward and backwards, you're actually putting compression on the other side. Now, if I were hammering the whole thing, then this whole edge would actually be stretching, but I'm only hammering one side and it's giving me a flared edge. So you can see how that could be an interesting decorative detail for a piece that you might be working on, maybe a cuff or you know, a pendant or something. So I'm gonna go ahead and continue and I'm gonna start in the center and work my way forward. I'm holding my metal right on the edge of my anvil. Yeah, that's what that is, <laughs> my anvil. <clears throat> I've got my grip correct, it's loose, and I'm holding onto the hammer and I'm letting it just fall. You overlap the blows so you can get the maximum stretch in the metal. And you kind of have to move it a little bit in order for you to keep the edge on your anvil so you're getting a flat hit what you don't want is something like this because that's not going to stretch it you're just going to be hammering in vain so you have to move it around just a little bit to keep it hammered to keep it flat on the anvil Now I'm lifting up as I get towards the end because it's starting to buckle 
and I'm going to just kind of work my way backwards instead of forwards. You want to keep your elbow loose, your shoulder loose, and your neck loose. Just relax and, and toss and throw the hammer. Well, throw the hammer, lift the hammer, let it bounce. I'm going to go over it a little bit more down here, make sure all my blows are completely overlapped. And you can see how it's starting to curl up, which is fun. <laughs> There's a lot of things you can do with the fold forming technique by hammering a joint. Okay. So now look at this piece of copper. It's wavy. It's longer on this side than it is on that side. I'm going to take my rubber mallet or my rawhide mallet and flatten it out so you can see it just a little bit better. Yeah, you can see the definition a whole lot more this way. Now look at this piece. See the difference? This was the edge that wasn't hammered, and this is the edge that got hammered with the cross pin. So you can see how it stretched in this direction and in this direction. So that's what a cross pin does. So if you want to stretch your metal in a very definitive way, you use your cross pin hammer. So now we're going to take a minute. I'm going to get set up for the ball pin hammer and I'll show you the ball pin hammer. Okay. Oh, I said I wasn't going to be on camera with my glasses. Oh, well, <laughs> who cares? I'm not that vain anyway, obviously, because my hair is a mess today. Anyway, we're going to go move on to the ball peen hammer. And with a ball peen hammer, essentially you have a ball end that's sort of flat, but it's still rounded. And then you have one that has more of a graded, tur uh, graded curve so that you can get a little bit deeper impression. So we're going to take this hammer and our piece of copper and hammer just one side like we did with the cross pin hammer. So again, I'm going to use the side that has the most curvature to it. I'm going to hold it just like I did the last hammer. I'm placing my metal on the edge of my anvil so my hammer does not strike the anvil. Instead, it hits just the copper. And I'm going to hammer just like I did with the cross pin hammer, start in the middle and work my way down and then go back to the middle and work my way up. That way you can see the definitive changes in how this hammer strikes versus the cross beam. All right, let's start. Okay, let's take a look at it. So now you can see the difference in the texture that the ball peen hammer gave versus the cross peen hammer. This made lines, made it look kind of feathery, whereas the ball peen hammer gives you these nice little depressions. Now, you'll notice that this piece of copper hasn't really stretched all that much yet. And that has to do with the fact that a ball peen hammer when you strike, whether it's a flat curvature or a flatter curvature or the very steep curvature, will spread your metal in all directions of that ball. So it'll go north and south and east and west, southwest, south, no, north, northwest, <laughs> northwest, northeast, you know what I mean. So it will stretch in all directions. So every time the hammer hits the metal, it's going to stretch in all directions. So you're getting an even stretch, but it's still going to deform the metal in the sense that on this particular piece, I'm only doing one half of it. So I'm going to go ahead and finish the top half here and then show you what it looks like. So I've got my hammer with my grip and my thumb down below. You don't have to grip it tight and you don't want your arm to be tight hammering. You want it to be loose, your wrist to be loose, your elbow to be loose. So here we go. Let me make sure I've got the right side. Yep.
So my metal is kind of rocking and rolling a little bit, but that's because of the stretch, but nowhere near as much of the metal movement that we're getting with the cross peen hammer. Okay, that's good. So you can see it's still stretched, very little. This side is still a little bit shorter and you can see it's actually curving because the metal is getting compressed on this side from all the hammer blows on that side. So it's actually compressing on both sides, but this is much more dramatic because that's the hammer hit side. This side's a little bit more subtle. So I'm gonna take the rawhide hammer and flatten this out because you can see it's got a nice little curvature going on there. So let's straighten it out. Yeah, now you can see this side is a little bit shorter. This side is a little bit flared out. You can tell by the edges right here how it's kind of flaring in this direction, flaring in that direction. But it's nowhere near the flare on that. Uh, let's take this back a little bit. The cross peen has flared it enough to where there's an edge peeking out from the ends here and it's stretched enough of the top piece that it's created this kind of fan-like shape. So next let's talk about when and how you use these or when and where you would use these. Okay so let's talk about when you would use these hammers. Really it's up to you. It's your choice. Um, it depends on what it is that you're trying to get out of the stretching of the metal. And I've got a few examples here to show you, but one of the things I recommend that you do before you start working on the pieces that you want is to create yourself a little texture plate like this. You see how I've got different hammer strikes here. There's some stampings, there's some cross pins, there's even some little engravings. What I do is take a piece of scrap copper, do your hammering, flatten it all out, solder, not solder, but anneal it and pickle it, clean it all up, and then take and put your patina on it. If you don't have a liver of sulfur patina, you can actually use Sharpie. Sharpie works really well. It's my all-purpose use in my studio. Um, do this first, then you can figure out what it is that your hammer is gonna do to the metal that you wanna use, and it'll be much easier for you to test on a cheap piece of copper versus your more expensive silver. So the couple of pieces I wanted to show you um, were made using a fold forming technique as well as a ball peen hammer. So the little bit of textures that you see on this uh, plate of metal is a ball peen hammer. And I did that to give it a unique look and a unique texture. And the ball peen that I was using was really tiny. It was actually smaller than my pinky. So if you can find some old hammers at a flea market or even at garage sales, pick them up because they're easy to clean and reface and be able to use them. Or even grind an old hammer down and make it a tiny little pinpoint so you can get small little um, texture marks like this. The second piece I wanted to show you is a cross peen hammer piece. This is something that I did um, for reading the Charles Luton Brain book about fold forming. He's got a bunch of information on the internet and he's a wonderful resource when it comes to fold forming. He's the man who developed it, plain and simple. So what I did with this piece is I took a piece of copper, folded it in half, and then I cut it in like a half circle. While it was still folded, I hammered on the outside edge that was not folded on both pieces. So this was actually closed like this. I used my cross peen hammer and hammered it this way until I got the stretch. And when I unfolded it, this is what happened. It's beautiful, it reminds me of a lily pad. Now on the underneath, you can see this very definite fold curvature here. This is the folded side that I did not hammer. That's the side that's probably the prettiest to me because that arch can get deeper depending on how much you hammer your metal. So this started out as a 20 gauge piece of copper, so I really couldn't hammer it, <clears throat> excuse me, hammer it too far because then it would have split and cracked and it wouldn't have been useful. The second piece is just the opposite. Well, no, it's not just the opposite. And <laughs> this one is the same. 
I did the same thing, except that I cut a piece of copper that was about three inches, three and a half, maybe close to four inches long, folded it in half, and then I cut it in one long, thin, narrow moon shape, and I hammered the side that was open, not the folded side. And as I hammered it, the metal started to deform and twist. So when I annealed it and used my pocket knife to split this part away from each other, it built this beautiful curvature. So I worked with that curvature and I actually took it with my fingers while it was still annealed and twisted it even more. And then finally I took some colored pencil and just put this colored pencil design on the outside of it, working with the textures to make it really look like a leaf. This could easily be, you know, a, a component for a pair of earrings, obviously not that big or maybe that big. I wouldn't wear them because they get caught up in my hair, but it's a nice little element. It could even be worn as a necklace. It could be worn as part of a cuff. You could bend it a little bit more, make it into a cuff. There's a lot of things you can do with this technique with just a couple of hammers, some heat from a torch, whether you have a propane torch set up like I do, or you have a burn from Lowe's or Home Depot, it doesn't matter. As long as it'll heat the copper up enough to anneal it, it'll be fine. So the next and final question, the last question I had from some of my folks was, when is the appropriate time to reface your hammers? That's gonna depend on how well you can control your hammer against an anvil or a steel block. If you are continuously hitting your hammer on the anvil or on the steel block, you'll start to notice these little depressions all over. As a matter of fact, I have a little mushroom stake here. I don't know if you can see those, but there's little depressions all over it because one of my students wasn't handling the hammer. Maybe she wasn't paying attention. I don't know exactly how it happened, but every time the hammer struck the metal, it caused a dent in my steel, which means there's probably a dent in my hammer too. So I have to inspect my hammers and reface them. So the better you get with the hammer control and not hitting your steel block or your anvil, the less you will have to reface your hammers. The hardest thing about it is you've got to hand sandpaper it, or if you have um, a belt sander, you can do a belt sander. The only thing I recommend if you're using a belt sander is that you keep a bucket of cool water handy because you don't want to overheat the metal, otherwise you'll ruin the temper on the hammer. So file it, I usually will sand it and file it to probably about a four to 600 grit sandpaper. And then I take it directly to um, my arbor polisher and I use a gray rouge and a red rouge to finely polish this surface to where it is shining back at you, it's mirror finish. Now this one is not mirror finish, it needs some work because this is the student one. As a matter of fact, this one I can feel has a bunch of dents in it. So once you've polished it and got it back to the original shine, or if it didn't even have it to begin with, you should probably do that before you use the hammer. Once you get it back to that high polish, I highly recommend putting some sort of metal oil on it, either a three in one oil that you can get at the hardware store, or I personally, I use a gunsmith's oil because the gunsmith's oil helps repel the dust. If you think about it, you put this in a slide of a, you know, some kind of a pistol, a semi-automatic pistol, it's to keep that slide moving and not getting it caught up with a bunch of dust and dirt from the ambient air. So I actually use gun oil on all my steel tools because it helps me, or it saves me time when it comes time to really spring clean the studio. So, I hope that answered your questions. Um, I know it was just a small little basic demonstration, but I just wanted to give you something to get you started with your hammer so you wouldn't be afraid of them or think that you didn't know anything about them. So if you have any questions, feel free to direct message me or send me an email, go to my website and send me a message there. I'd love to help you out if you have any questions about it. Again, if you like this video and you wanna see more, subscribe to my channel and like my channel, give me the thumbs up and leave me some comments to let me know how I'm doing. Thanks everybody, goodbye. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more videos. Thank you for watching.